People are feeling tired. They're tired. They're exhausted from all of the exponential changes that we've experienced over the past three years at both macro and micro levels. And I say, you know, this is really one of the biggest insights that I've gained from some recent keynote speeches that I've done. It's that people are tired. They're exhausted. And they're looking for a way forward beyond the complexity and the chaos that we're all experiencing now in the age of AI. And that's why on today's show of the Banking on Digital Growth podcast, we're going to explore how financial brands can empower their people to confidently navigate the complexities of exponential change. Greetings and hello, I'm James Robert Lay, and welcome to another episode of the Banking on Digital Growth podcast. Today's episode is part of the Exponential Insight series, and I'm excited to welcome Todd to the show. Todd is the founder and principal of Salty, a boutique company that is a consulting firm who's partnering with credit unions, with banks, to simplify, to prioritize, and most importantly, to execute their strategy while empowering their teams to deliver constantly. Todd's also an ex-paper boy. An ice cream maker. But on today's show, we're going to talk about how financial brands can empower their people to confidently navigate the inherent complexities found within exponential change that's stemming from the age of AI. Welcome to the show, Todd. It is great to share time with you today, buddy. Listen, excited to be here and hoping we can find enough time to talk about my paper boy and ice cream making skills, but we'll see if we can get to that or not. Well, you know what? We're, we will definitely cover that because I'm curious. Uh, with with my four yeah. little ones, um, they're definitely they have an entrepreneurial kick to them, and they're always looking for a way to make a, a, an extra dollar by creating value for others. And so, right now, it's the 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 heat of summer in Houston, and so snow cones are top of mind for them. And we're going to see if they they bring that snow cone stand to fruition. But before we get too far ahead of ourselves, talking about change and transformation, what's good in your world right now, personally or professionally? <laughs> it's your pick to get started. Listen, we'll always start on the personal front. That's got to be locked and loaded. So I'm, I'm also a father of four and married. So is in the, in the throngs of summer. All is good there, getting the right kind of balance. And then on the professional side, you know, I've been running Salty Co. for about nine months now. And growth continues to happen in all the right ways. And I get to continue to partner with great clients and have got great conversations with future clients. So hoping that that continues to move forward in all the right ways. And I keep adding value and keep growing Saltico in all the ways it should be growing. So really excited to be with you today. Well, I'm excited to hear about that. And, you know, as, as I mentioned uh, in my opening thoughts, we've, we've experienced a tremendous amount of change over the last three, three and a half years through the COVID experience. You've experienced a tremendous amount of change since launching uh, Saltico. I, I want to start there. Why? Why go down that path? Why, why take a leap to leave leave the nest, if you will, for after 20 years in almost, quote unquote, the corporate world working within financial services. Why? Yeah, it's a really good question. You know, I think everything everything happens at the right time when it's supposed to happen, even if it doesn't feel that way. So I'd spent almost 12 years working for SunTrust, had a lot of great roles there, was able to lead a lot of great teams, worked for a lot of great leaders. And then I was thankful enough to be able to go over to Synovus mm. uh, post the merger with Truist. And once again, Great leaders, um, you know, great CEO at the helm right now. Good friends, actually, with Kevin. Yeah. And it was just the right timing. You know, it was one of those things where everything was great and loved the direction Synovus is going in. But there's been this entrepreneurial bug inside of me. And for, for years and years, I thought it was the Shark Tank entrepreneurial bug. Like, it was like, drop a product, scale the product, things go crazy. Uh, I actually launched a sock company at one point. Didn't work. Launched many ideas, you know, even quietly. None of them really worked. And then I realized I was over complicating it. And where I added the most value was the knowledge and the experience that I had running large organizations and large teams and remaining human and remaining a leader and making other people win. And I realized there was a need for that to take that human approach to leadership and to change management with credit unions and with smaller banks. So it was the right timing. I had a little bit of a, a little bit of a, you know, runway kind of built ahead of me sure. and I went for it and it's been uh, it's been a great, it's been a blessing at this point. You know, that entrepreneurial bug that you're talking about with ice cream and um, thinking about the, uh, the paper boy talk, to, how does that play into who you are today doing what you're doing today? 
Yeah, it's a, I'll, I'll answer it two ways. Number one, the paper boy probably just proves that I, that I'm, I may look you know younger than I really am because there was a back in the day <laughs> where people actually rolled papers and delivered them. You know, so for me it was watching Saved by the Bell reruns and folding papers and then literally. You're bringing me back, man. Friend. You're bringing me back. L- listen, it was like I had back to back Saved by the Bell, back to back Full House, and I was rolling papers with my buddy, and we'd throw them outside of the van. And then the second piece, you know, the ice cream making, that was one of my first real jobs in high school, but that's where I met my wife in high school was at an ice cream store. So, you know, I always throw that in there because who I am today is probably because I was that, you know, I I call myself the fastest ice cream maker in the South, you know, that those ice cream making skills clearly impressed her enough to stay along. And that's been kind of the driving force for all success that I've had at this point in my life has been, you know, me impressing this, this, this one year older than I am crew leader of, Hey, look how great I am at making ice cream. Just wait what I can do in the banking world. If you stick with me. So, it's uh, it's worked out at this point. Well, let's connect those the, those two narratives. There, you go from ice cream uh, into financial services, and then from financial services back into this entrepreneurial journey. A lot yeah. of change, a lot of transformation. The biggest lesson, looking back over the experiences you've had uh, within just your own personal change, your own personal transformation. What's maybe a common theme or a common pattern? Uh, that that could be applied for the dear listener who is obviously working within financial services and marketing and sales and leadership. Yeah. So I think, you know, it's hard to boil it down to one, but when I think about it, I think there's, there's a few elements. Number one, you know, as much as I might not think I'm a risk taker, I'm actually more of a risk taker than, than I believe myself to be, you know, one of which I was actually a business major in college and then I got frustrated. So I dropped my business major and I majored in film, which is a bit of a risk. And then when I was getting out of college, I was engaged to my, then girlfriend now wife and i realized I, I couldn't go into the film world i needed to do something more secure so i jumped into financial services with really no background so that was like the first element and really everything i've done every big leap i've made there's been a significant risk involved even as i think my first kind of real job out of college then going into the banking space it was a was it was a risk and then certain big promotions i got although they're promotions within suntrust they were risks that i was taking even when i left suntrust there was a risk involved in the job i was taking so there's all of that. But then I think the second piece of it is there's risk. And then there's this level of, of needing to earn it. Mm. And, you know, maybe it's this old school work mentality, but I, I always try to, you know, when I was running large organizations, large teams, I tried to really drill it into the teams I worked for. I'm like, listen, I know you want it now. I know you want the next thing, but you've got to earn it. And then when I think about every single one of those big risks I took, those risks only worked out and played out because I earned it on the back end. I had, I had to then earn and prove the right. And even Saltico right now, I've had some conversations with folks like, I'm thinking about going to consulting. I'm like, great. You mean to tell you what it's really like? The grind behind the scenes, if you got it in you, because it's real. And if you've got it and you're willing to earn it, it'll be great. But, I, I, you know, planting seeds is, is a bit of a tedious process. And you've got to be constantly harvesting and, and watering those seeds to actually grow it to something worth any of harvesting. And all of that takes still the same mentality from day one of take the risk and then earn it to be able to see it to fruition. Absolutely. You're talking about risk and you're talking about earn it and you're talking about film uh, makes me think about saving private Ryan and the scene when he's like, earn it, you got to earn this, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. And, 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 and that idea of risk um, and maybe perhaps within financial services, uh, I see sometimes risk aversion, um, trying to, yeah. to limit that. When you think about the work that you're doing now, um, maybe on the other side, uh, through the consulting, what what are some of the challenges, some of the roadblocks that you are seeing, that you are hearing about, that individuals, maybe teams, are having to collaborate to break through together? Listen, I think I think one of the hardest things to get anyone to do is something different. And I think it takes real, raw human leadership to get teams there. So I think the biggest, honestly, the biggest challenges that I see is I work with organizations and I work with, you know, the C-suite and work with senior leaders within these organizations yeah. is trying to think about how the team's going to react to any change we're going to do. And these aren't astronomical changes, but in their world, it might feel like it's a sure. huge risk. I'm used to talking to members or I'm used to talking to clients in a certain way. And now I've got to talk to them in a different way, or now I've got to approach it with maybe a little bit of a different intention. And what I always try and do, and I say this a lot, and someone can go steal it out there and they can try and use it. I'll just, I'll outwork you. So steal it if you want. Um, I'm always end user mentality. It's all I'm ever thinking about. 
So as I'm working with clients, one of the differentiators that I try and bring into the mix is like, hey, I know we're talking about all these like strategic big changes, but here's one difference between me and other folks maybe. I've actually done them and I've led thousand people organizations through them. And all I'm ever thinking about is the end user. So I'll boil it down to the most entry level role and say, how are they gonna take on this yes. change? And how do we need to get in their mind and their heart to actually embrace the change? And how do we need to get leadership to support that change? Yes. And that's where we're spending a lot of time because that, in my mind, that is the differentiator. You know, it's funny, I mentioned on your, your LinkedIn post, I think yesterday, not yesterday, but whenever it was, you know, specifically about you referenced SunTrust, you referenced this purpose driven. Right. And I said, hey, I was in the trenches because yes. I was in the trenches. That wasn't like build, drop something from above and we just run with it. It was like, if you're a leader and you care about it and it makes sense, then you're in the trenches and you're getting your team's hearts and minds behind it. Yep. And that's what it was for the leaders that took it seriously. And that's just, that's always been my approach. It's this human led leader mentality and it's still being applied constantly in the work I'm doing on the Salty Co front. I think about that, that, that SunTrust example and you mentioned you being in the trenches um, it wasn't dropped from the top. It's a great point because I think when you think about transformation, it doesn't matter if it's digital transformation, cultural transformation, brand transformation. When transformation is is taken from the external, um, i.e. Mm -hmm. the, the corporate level, and then pushed into the teams and the teams of the individual, I see that's where there's a lot of conflict. But when you flip this yep. around, you're talking about the end user, and there's the end user internally, and there's the end user externally. All transformation mm -hmm. begins within. It starts with the individual, and then it moves to the teams because teams are made up of individuals. And then from the teams, teams make up organizations, and that can even spill over into the lives of account holders. And so, so there's this tr transformational energy to a degree that it, it, yep. it begins to, to take root. Uh, before we get too far ahead, I, I want to come back to the, the, the human aspect of this because it's, these are patterns of human transformation. Um, it doesn't matter if it's personal. It doesn't matter if it's professional. What is it though that holds the individual back? If we're breaking this down to the most smallest piece, what holds people back from committing to a transformational journey or navigating the complexities of, of change? Yeah. I listen, I think not to get too like philosophical on here, but we can just, get philosophical I because I'll, I'll, I, that is a big area. If we don't understand this, then I think everything else becomes much harder. So please let's, let's go philosophical. Yeah. Listen, and, and the philosophy creates a hack for the folks that get it right. So the philosophical element is, is human nature is people love comfort and they love, they love complacency and they love comfort. It's, yeah. it's rooted in their soul for some reason. It shouldn't be. It wasn't originally. It is. And people love it. They love the comfort of, of, of just knowing what, what they're going to expect from day one to day two. Right. And I think that's the core root of it. It's, it's this fear of the unknown. It's fear of the change. It's, mm. So I think part of this, you know, and this is why I, even in, in my current role and previous roles, you know, having that film degree major, having this like creativity in my brain since day one, right. it kind of created this storytelling ability for me. Yes. So whenever I had big changes come through from a leadership perspective, it was like, it wasn't in it. And in, at times it's, it's dropped from above. It's like just thrown at you and, and right. you can duck, duck, duck and block it. Or I just took it and I was like, all right, I got it in my hands. And I'm like, all right, so what is this? And then I had to craft it and say, okay, how is this now going to impact the team? And then I had to tell the story as to why it made sense. And I had to tell the story as to why they needed to be bought into it and why I thought it would make sense. So the sooner I could say, here's why you don't need to be scared, or even in some instances, and I know a really specific example, when I first uh, started working at, in a new role at SunTrust, I was running a premier banking group, which is our brand new, we dropped this massive fluent strategy. And there was this unknown, never done it before. There's two other teams that were built. I was a third team. I had to hire 12 premier bankers. I did it in like 30 days, got in trouble from some external companies because I took all their people. It never got in real trouble, but a little bit of trouble, got a phone call. But we, we built this thing fast and there was a lot of unknown. And what I realized early on is I was like, hey team, like we're gonna be tripping on potholes. Like they're, they're everywhere, there's potholes everywhere. So just know up front, you're gonna trip on them. Yep. But I do need you running and you're gonna trip and you're gonna break your nose. There's gonna be blood everywhere. I said, but I need you to get back up. I need you to keep running. And then the next time you see that same pothole, I need you to jump over it. Yeah. Okay. So I need you to do. And then they took it and they ran with it. And they mm -hmm. were like, it's okay if we make mistakes. It's okay if they're going to fail. We're going to have blowouts. Things aren't going to work out. But I needed them to keep running. I needed them to keep recognizing it and seeing it. And I saw other teams 
were still complaining about the same potholes every day. That's all they were doing. Right. So when I got the bigger role where I ran seven of those teams and I was running half the company, I had to then preach that message to everyone to say, listen, this is why it's working here. And this is why we need to scale it everywhere else. I had to paint that picture and tell that story. And it helped reduce some of that fear of the unknown. And it allowed the human element of the team to then embrace the change and start running with me. You bring up a very interesting point, and I want to stay on this topic for just a bit around narrative and around story. And that's built into your DNA because of your educational background with film. Uh, I think about, for example, Joseph Campbell's work, um, Hero with a Thousand Faces, really understanding the archetypal patterns of story and narrative. Um, you know, we can go from looking at the Star Wars saga to the Karate Kid, and that could be the 80s, that could be the reboot with Cobra Kai. They all follow a very common pattern of transformation. Um, yep. How much, thinking about your own experience, but then maybe also working, coaching, leading others, does understanding, because it comes back to the philosophy, I think, understanding the nuances of narrative patterns and archetypes and then being able to use that as part of the communication patterns and cadence to positively influence the hearts and minds of other people. I, I think it absolutely, that, that's, I think that's the hack I was referencing before, yeah. right? If you get it and you understand it, now you've just, now you've had to earn the hack because you had to understand it and then you had to do something about it. But I, I think that's the, that's a differentiator, you know? And I, and I think about when I, when I think back on, you know, some of the previous roles I took, you know, I was the one that was, what was both, Hey, give me something brand new. that's never been done. Let me run with it. Or give me the team that has struggled, sure. you know, for years and give me them. And that was, you know, and, and I had to figure that out. I mean, even one of my, one of my really, really big breaks at SunTrust was, Hey, we have this Atlanta division, 140 branches that was just underperforming for years. It's kind of awkward for the Atlanta division in the heart of the corporate office right. to underperform. So my boss said, Hey, it, it's yours and it's a fishbowl. Good luck. And he just threw me out there. And I'm this, you know, spiky haired 31 year old kid running, you know, 140 branches. And I just went in there and it was all about the story. And, you know, I remember my first big meeting with the team. Yeah. You know, I, there, I I'd spent like two or three weeks with the team out listening and understanding what the challenges were and where there were roadblocks, you know, really bad engagement, horrible retention, bad performance. I'm like, great, this is a cakewalk. Right. And I just, I had to remind the team something. So in our first big meeting, it was already scheduled. We had all the branch managers together, all my team, all the branch managers are waiting. And then they're all in this big room at some Marriott in Atlanta. The lights drop, total black. And then you hear the Bulls theme come on. Like the dun, dun, dun. Oh, absolutely, dun, dun, dun. yeah. I, right? Yeah, my kids love that song, then, actually. Right? And then, and then we have everyone on my team get introduced. And then I get introduced last to be able to address the team. And I, and I spoke for maybe five or 10 minutes and I spoke to them about this idea of having ability over authority. I was mm. like, I don't need any of you to have the authority to do anything different. I need you to know you have the ability to do something different. And we are going to do something different. And my theme was, it's because we have home court advantage. Yeah. I was like, we're in Atlanta and this is our home court. So let's do something about it. Right. And then my goal was to then strip away all the complexities, continue that narrative for the team. So a year later, number one performing team in the company, wow. highest retention in the company. We went from like 35% retention to like 12. Okay. And probably saved like $3 million a year. And then highest engagement scores. And I just kept playing different narratives based off the team I was on and the team I was running, whether it's new or whether it was existing, whether they're good, whether they're bad, didn't matter. I had a team of human beings with hearts that I needed to find a way to get them to all win. And then in the end, help the company. So I've just been repeating that model for, for years at this point. I, I think you, you did something that can be pattern matched to what I am writing and thinking about a lot lately is the four, the four steps of human transformation. Step one, okay. you got to help people see things differently than how they saw it before. And that can come through education. That can come through an experience like you're talking about here. You're just, you're, yep. you're shifting the lens. Like we've, we've got home court advantage. Like oh, I've never thought about it that way. I've never seen it that way because when you see things differently, that's where you begin to think about things differently. And I've asked this question hundreds of times now. Well, what happens next? When you see different, you think different Then what did this in a couple of keynotes last week and you know, 95%, oh, I'm going to act different. I'm going to be different. I'm going to do different. And then I'm like, well, are you? Because how many times do we have the knowledge that we need to do something different and then we fail, yep. fail to take action? And I'm like the first one raising my hand. I'll be the first one to admit. And of course, everyone else raises their hand as well. 
to bridge sure. the gap between the thought and the action comes back to something that I think you did through this experience here and perhaps even the work that you're doing now is it's the feeling, it's the emotion and the desire, the feeling, the emotion to take the action, to be different, to do different has to be greater, in some cases exponentially greater than the desire to remain the same and stuck in the cave of complacency, which is the status quo where we want to be. What's your take on that? The I, What role does feeling and emotion play within the transformational journey of people? I think it's, I think it's the core driver. I mean, it's the gasoline that keeps it going. Yeah. And I think what you find and what, what, where you see problems come in and I listen, any problem that exists and it's just my, my personality, I, I throw it back on leadership yeah. and usually it's me, right? Sure. Like, Oh, that's a problem. Great. Yeah. It's leadership. Like every time it's leadership. Cause first off, number one, if I always blame it on leadership, it means I have control on changing the outcome Yes. or I have the ability to empower my team or the leaders that should be the ones doing it to change the outcome. So I think the idea that the feeling and the emotion part is the absolute gasoline what I realize is as in my role as a leader or as, as an advisor helping teams understand this was I needed to then take exponential action on my own to continue to produce that feeling, right? Wow. And, in, and at, at that point, and this is 2014, like mid-2014, 2015, what did I do? I needed to continue to keep these folks engaged. I started dropping weekly podcasts at work produced mm. by myself. You know, that six months later, that turned into weekly videos that I produced for the team. And I kept that weekly video theme going for a solid four years later. Wow. So I produced a weekly video for four years straight with that team, with another team. And I went and picked up another team. And then halfway through that, I doubled up and I did two videos a week yes. because I needed to keep that feeling and that emotion and the direction of why we were doing these things. I needed to keep it top of mind and I needed to keep the team focused and engaged. And now what I was also doing simultaneously, which is probably the other hardest part of any change or any leadership role is accountability. Yeah. Because if I was driving any kind of change, what I did is I was now basically, you know, time stamping Correct. and recording all of the expectations that were out there or the very few expectations I had, just me saying them a million times to where no one was free of not understanding where we are going and why we are going there. Yes. So it made market visits, it made coaching sessions a lot easier because I'm like, don't tell me you didn't know. <laughs> There's been four videos on this one subject, three of which I role modeled. Right. So why, why haven't you taken the action I've done three times? Yes. That's a that's great, accountability. it's accountability. And I think that's the, that's where the coaching comes back into play because, you know, when you think about, and I think about the work that I, I, I've done over the years from the, you know, we'll look at the lens of consulting or advisory is you follow mm -hmm. a path of di diagnose and then you prescribe and then people yep. sometimes are left hanging on, okay, they might start, but then they fall back in the old patterns, the old behaviors, the old habits. It's the coaching aspect, continuously bringing people back to the why, reinforcing yep. that through communication. And I think what you're talking about as a leader, using exponential technologies, you're exponentially multiplying yourself to communicate at scale with hundreds of people to provide them with ongoing perspective and then tying it back to, hey, this is why we're doing it. This is the progress that we've been making and let's keep continuing to move forward together. Looking ahead towards the future now, um, you know, there's, I still say this is going to be a, a, the decade of exponential change. AI is going to drive a lot about uh, a lot of this. And if we think about, you know, what we've experienced since 1994 with the, uh, the internet reaching the mass consciousness of humanity is we're almost 30 years later, it's going to make that experience compressed and it's going to yep. feel a bit challenging. It's going to feel a bit confusing and complex and chaotic. What are the opportunities for financial brands and, and really to the point of this conversation, for leaders to put people, and I really think first and foremost internally, to put people at the center of their thinking, the center of their doing, so that people feel confident through the steps they're taking in a world that just feels a little different than what it did three, three and a half years ago, and will probably continue to feel so going forward. Yeah, I, you know, I think, I think leaders have an opportunity and although there's all these changes and although there's all this, you know, AI and technology, I think the core of where leaders can show up still remains the same. And it's a lot of times it's just go first and, and help me feel comfortable that we're making this change together. Yeah. And I think leaders have the opportunity to jump in front of it yeah. and to call it out. And I was always a big fan of like, listen, I, I'll call out, I'll make it as awkward as you want because awkward usually leads to awesome every single time. Yeah. If you, if you avoid it, you're never going to get to awesome. So I'd love the awkward conversation. 
because that awkward coaching conversation, a lot of times, if done right, can lead to some awesome performance yes. and, and the person actually sticking around. So I think with all of this, I think there's an opportunity to jump in front of it. And I think with, with any leadership role, jump in front of it and either try and role model it or role model how it should be played out. Because when you do that, and honestly, that's a big thing with any engagement I have on the Salt Eco front is there's this constant push, no matter what we're doing, the quickest way to get sustainment or adoption is you, we got to find a way to, to get leaders prepped and equipped to be out in front of this thing mm. and to be role modeling it early on, early and often, yes. as much as you can, because that's the quickest way we can see change start to happen. And that's why like, I almost never do an engagement for anything new that doesn't involve a coaching arm, because I'm like, the, the only way this thing gets sustained sure. is if there's people coaching to it. Yeah. And I don't think it's going to, whether it's how to, how to get on the internet and how to download AOL instant messenger, you know, 25, 30 years ago right. to where what, whatever chaos might be coming our way, yeah. it's still, here's what we can expect. And here's all the things I don't know that are going to happen, but you'll see me in front failing and learning and continuing to move forward. And, and I need you doing the same thing. So, so it does give, but it's going to take some gusto on leadership's part to be the ones willing to go out in front into a world of unknown yeah. if they want any chance of their team doing the same thing. Sure. No, that's a, that's a fantastic point. It's, it's, it's leading by example. It's, it's leading the way it's taking the point, you know, one thought is, as we start to wrap up here, really on a practical note, um, you mentioned the awkward conversation leads to awesomeness. I, I love that perspective. So let's yeah. wrap up on this, you know, give, give the dear listener a, a very practical next best step, something small that they can apply on their own journey of growth to initiate yeah. the awkward conversation that we might not be so good at having naturally. Yeah. So I'll, I'll do a few, I'll just throw a few examples. So sure. kind of like scale, scale the whole audience. Right. Um, and I, at some point I got to trademark all these, these sayings I have, I just, they're not anywhere and just, they're, they're just in my head. And I've talked to them at one point, but here's, here's one thing. Like if I'm, if I'm a teammate, I work for a financial organization, you know, sometimes having that awkward conversation with, with a member or a client yeah. is the differentiator for, for that member's life or that client's life. Because the question you might think is awkward needs to be asked because if you don't ask it and there isn't dialogue there, then that, that person's financial future might be in ruins and yeah. you just were never you were never willing to take that awkward moment that yes. you think's awkward that could change that person's life to something fantastic yes. right so have the conversation ask the questions and if you care about them and that's why you're asking it then don't worry if it's awkward it's going to lead to something great and i think from a leadership perspective and from a coaching perspective everyone listening who's a leader you have someone on your team that you're avoiding having that conversation with and i'm not i'm not saying come in like hammer style and start hammering into them because you're the, the boss. I'm saying embrace that awkward conversation. Try to understand what's getting in the way. And although it might be uncomfortable, it's the whole swallow. It's like the Seth Godin swallow the frog. Like let's do a first thing, swallow the frog first thing. Yeah. First thing in the morning, do the hardest thing possible. Everything else rolls its way out a little bit. So leaders need to have these awkward conversations and even more so now in changing times, have those conversations now because if anything, you're better equipping and preparing that teammate to go do good things. And when you avoid the awkward conversation, you're basically saying, you know, good luck. And I hope you fail. Cause you're just not, you're not having the conversation. So I have it now. And I've got a handful of examples where I've had really one of which is gonna talk about really awkward conversations with teammates. And because I had them, they've now exponentially shot through the roof. Yeah, It wasn't really my doing. I just happened to have the conversation. They then did something with it, but I did have to have that little spark to kind of ignite it to get moving in the right direction. Yeah, you know, you, you talk about eat that frog. That's actually an episode that Audrey and I did going back to 236. And it's how you can proactively, and I think that's the key point, you proactively have to defeat procrastination. And if you're procrastinating about something, have the deeper philosophical conversation starting with yourself. Why? Yep. Why Why am I not taking the action that I need to take that I know I should need to be taking? Really dig into that and, and perhaps even connect with, with you, Todd. This has been a great conversation. Speaking about connecting with you, what is the best way for someone to reach out, start a conversation, continue the conversation that we've started here today? No, absolutely. So I'm, I'm extremely active on LinkedIn. So anyone could find me on LinkedIn. I think that's pretty easy. I'll probably be tagged when this thing drops. And then you know, my uh, Salty Coast site is, is actually called GetSalty.com, which is just G-E-T-S-A-L-T-E-E.com. -E -E and it's Todd at GetSalty.com. So if anyone's have a conversation, 
you can get me there. You can put me an email. You can send me a DM. My response rate is astronomically great. So uh, there's a high probability. Even if you pitch me something, you're still going to get a response. Even if it's a, uh, you got to get better at pitching. Uh, you're going to get a response from me. I love it. Connect with Todd, learn with Todd, grow with Todd. Todd, thank you so much for such a, a great conversation on the Banking on Digital Growth podcast. It's been a lot of fun. Listen, thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Until next time, and as always, be well, do good, and be the light.